have my phone out because I am the moderator and timekeeper, but we are going to ask all of you to have your phones out so you can start right from the beginning, um, slide-doing, is that the word, your questions in. Um, for those of you who prefer to write them, please feel free to write them down, and um, Heather will be sitting up in the front here. So thank you for that. I have two announcements before we get started. The first is if you kept your headset overnight and you think it is broken, it is not broken, it is out of battery. Um, you need to turn in your headsets at the end of the day. Um, so please just remember that if you picked up a headset, turn it in at the end of the day so they can recharge them overnight. The second is there is a sign up wall in the village and our GNB colleagues and all of us are really asking if people can go by there, sign up who you are, your name, where you're from, and a commitment that you're making. This is going to be our group document of who was here and our shared commitments. Please don't do that right now because you'll miss an amazing panel, um, but please do feel free to do that during the breaks. Um, so I'm Margaret Hempel. I am currently working as a consultant to the Ford Foundation. Um, I recently stepped down from a position there. I was the director of their racial, gender, and ethnic justice unit. The Ford Foundation is a private foundation based in New York with offices and does grant making in 10 regions um, outside of the US and the US as well. Um, we are one of the foundations that provided support for work around ending child marriage. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to note that most of the sessions at this meeting really center on your work, on the work of the membership, be it community-based work, research, policy advocacy. Um, and this particular session, which is a donor panel, comes from the request of many of you who wanted a chance to have more real engagement with the kind of other part of this sector, which are donors who provide support for the kind of work that you do. And from a real, I think, shared desire that we have, regardless of what hat you wear, to find ways to have somewhat more open and transparent conversations with each other. Um, we know that to end child marriage and ensure kind of strong futures for young women in all of our countries, it needs us to work together. We have to be aligned. We also have to find ways to be more open and trusting with each other, to share what's working and what's not. Um, so this panel, I will be clear, is not a will you fund my project panel. I will tell you up front if that's the question you send in. Um, we are not prepared to answer that specific question. But for example, um, just to give folks here a heads up, one of the questions we got already, a question like donors tend to have a long-term vision. They know this will take 10 to 20 years to change, but you fund us on a one-year cycle. Um, how do you align that? That kind of question we're willing to grapple with. Um, so just as you start thinking about how you want to engage with us. Um, and in the spirit of frankness, I also just wanted to make a few comments on kind of the, the donor world or philanthropy. Um, and what I would say is there are real power dynamics and there's real geopolitical dynamics in all of our work. Um, I think in the funding community, I would dare say that we have progressed less than many of the other communities that we're able to support in terms of how we've addressed the power imbalances, the diversity of who's in the room. Um, but there's many of us who are really working to change this, and I would say folks on this panel, and I know many of you in the room. Um, so for example, what we call donor countries still tend to be largely situated in what we think of as northern countries. Um, the idea of organized philanthropy is something that is really, I would say, still largely centered in the US and Europe, although many of you in the room um, are doing work to really encourage a new kind of philanthropy in the countries where and regions where you live and work. Um, the power dynamics between those who support projects and organizations and those who are seeking funding, they're very real. We're not here today to pretend that they're not, but what we are hoping to do is to create some kind of space to bring you in a little bit to understand the world that 
these colleagues kind of live and work in and some of the challenges that they face, and also to open a conversation with you about um, things that you've seen working well, but also things that you have questions about. So this is really an invitation for a conversation. <clears throat> and that's really easy for me to say because I'm just the friendly moderator. Um, but we have an extraordinary set of colleagues who've agreed to be part of this conversation. Um, we have, you know, I'll just pass the mic down so you hear in people's voices and ask each of you to just give your name and your institution and then we'll go from there. My name is Kathleen Flynn Dava and uh, my institution is Global Affairs Canada. Good morning, my name is Mieke Vogels and I'm working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Good morning, my name is Dina Kimball and I'm with the Candida Fund. Good morning, my name's Jo Cook and I work for the UK's Department for International Development or DFID or DFID, we go by any of them. Good morning, my name is Adriana de Magala. I work for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Good morning all, my name is Maxence Doblin, working for the EU Commission. Thank you. And so what we're going to do is we have um, four brief slide presentations from my first uh, four colleagues, and then um, two commentators, and then depending on how many questions you've sent in, we will either start with me asking one of the questions we've received already or go right to your questions. Just to remind you, for those of you who are using the Slido app, you can both enter your own question, but you can also um, like, I guess that is, you like, I guess it's a like figure. You can like, and the more those get, the higher up it rises on the queue. Um, so with that, let me first turn to, um, we have our slides, yes. So here you go. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about what Canada is doing to end child marriage. And as the title of my uh, slide says, uh, we're more than just funders because Global Affairs Canada is a ministry that includes foreign affairs, trade and develop international development. And we work on child early enforced marriage as a human rights issue and a development issue. So next slide, please. So there are three main ways then that we are working to end child marriage. Um, the first one deals with multilateral engagement, and that really involves our work on resolutions. And a very important part of our work on resolutions from the start has been that we wanted to work with uh, countries from the South and from high prevalence countries. So at the United Nations, every other year, with the government of Zambia, we co-lead a resolution, in a human rights resolution, on ending child marriage. Um, we also participate in uh, the core group of the Human Rights Council on an, another resolution that happens every other year on ending child marriage. And we've worked with regional organizations, uh, for example, within La Francophonie with the government of Benin to put forward a resolution in 2016. And we've worked with the Organization of American States to put child early enforced marriage on their agenda more strongly as well. And so this fall, we will once again with Zambia work to run a resolution at the United Nations with a core group of countries from all the different regions uh, to try and keep this up on the agenda at the highest political level. The second thing that we do is policy engagement and advocacy. So, um, you know, yesterday AB mentioned the International Day of the Girl Child. Canada was very instrumental in helping to create that day, and we continue to um, have a very strong presence on that day. Uh, with uh, the AU, we have been supporting the campaign. Um, and with Girls Not Brides, we have done a number of important advocacy events, including a photo exhibit called Girls Voices, which has been shown in our embassies around the world. And just earlier this month at the G7, we worked with other G7 development ministers to put forward the Whistler Declaration on Unlocking the Power of Adolescent Girls. And the third thing that we do, of course, is programming. And since 2013, we have had, um, we've committed over $90 million in targeted programming. This has been with the UN and with civil society partners. And we have a new priority on addressing sexual and gender-based violence through Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy, which is putting even more effort behind important issues, in particular child early enforced marriage. Next slide, please. 
So we were asked to talk about what you should know about working with Canada. And I thought about sort of three important things for you to know. So the first I mentioned that we have a feminist international assistance policy. And that means that for anything that we do, any proposal that we receive, a gender-based analysis is absolutely essential. And we, in fact, have very ambitious targets to increase programming that specifically targets gender inequality and the empowerment of women and girls. With new signature initiatives like Her Voice, Her Choice, and Women's Voice in Leadership that are working on issues like sexual and reproductive health and rights and supporting women's rights organizations. And across any programming, regardless of what it is, you need to have this strong gender analysis. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, as much as I'm here today, I'm not always the right person to really talk about your actual project ideas. And that's because as a big ministry, we have programs for every country, and those programs are actually often decentralized. So it's actually in the missions in the, in the countries where a lot of the decisions are made. So my advice to you is to build relationships with our local missions. If you have a Girls Not Brides partnership, I would recommend that you actually send a letter to the mission and, and introduce the partnership and introduce the members. Um, the, the missions love working with civil society, not only funding them, but bringing them in for advocacy events and helping to amplify the messages that you have. So they really are a wonderful resource. And along with that are the international NGOs that are working there that already have those relationships and may be a part of your network. So talk to them too about building that relationship. The final thing that I would say is that we are a ministry, which means we have a treasury board that sets up a lot of rules and we're accountable to taxpayers. So two things that you need to know is that we do use results-based management, which means you need to learn how to set up you know, a, a, a program that can measure results and articulate the results that you want. And there are a lot of due diligence processes, so looking at your uh, administrative and financial systems, et cetera, that take a lot of time and effort to go through. So it does take a lot of patience if you're a new partner to move through that approval process. Um, and we do a lot of things to encourage new partners um, by, for example, if we have a call for proposals, we encourage you to go into a, a consortium with established partners uh, so that you can learn those processes with someone. Um, with Women's Voice and Leadership, we often have an intermediary organization who will do the due diligence that we require so that we can move funding faster because they will sub-grant. And so I think it's important to understand um, those aspects and to know that you know, how you administer your organization does matter. And finally, I'll just go to the last slide. Uh, we were asked to talk about sort of, th sort of three things around advancing the global movement. And I wanted to point to our G7 development ministers meeting again. Um, and the fact that at that, uh, that meeting, we brought six young women to sit at the table with development ministers. And we brought in um, experts to speak as well, including someone who leads um, a youth-led organization, a feminist youth-led organization. And the, the declaration really talks about our organizations investing in policies that are focused on um, girl-led and girl-centered approaches. Um, you heard yesterday about the education commitment. Of, um, the World Bank mentioned their portion of it. In total, it was $3.8 billion. It was Canada, the EU, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the World Bank. And um, that education commitment is a very broad commitment that includes addressing the barriers to education. And that, are, that is things like early pregnancy and child marriage and violence. Um, so I think it's a real opportunity for us to build from, that we have that consensus. Um, the, other, the other two points I'll speak to a bit together, and that is that you know, success is not going to be just about making sure that girls don't get married by 18. Um, the reason that we're all in this, and when you look at the Girls Not Brides theory of change, it's because we actually want all girls in all settings to realize their full potential. And to do that, it's not just about target 5.3. Um, yesterday, Mabel mentioned eight out of 17 targets that we need to have our eye on. 
And I think that's really important because it means it's not just about the targeted programming, it's about the targeted programming and then it's about building the bridges and the synergies with other sectors. And that means we really do need to be working with health and nutrition, education, gender equality, and you know, addressing all forms of sexual and gender-based violence. So that is my uh, little introduction. Thank you, merci tout le monde. Okay, well, good, mor good morning again, everybody. Um, uh, what does the Netherlands do to help end child marriage? The first slide has gone already. Anyhow, uh, the, the title, I think, was uh, The Netherlands and the Fight Against Child Marriage. Those of you who know me, uh, they know that I do not like fights. But this one, I am very happy to participate in because this fight does not know any losers, I think. The fight against child marriage only has winners. Okay, that was the first slide on my paper, but maybe I didn't send it in. Okay, what does the Netherlands do to help end uh, child marriage? Um, we do, uh, we finance different programs, just like uh, our colleague from uh, Canada just explained. We uh, finance uh, different programs at different levels because we know that uh, the issue of um, child marriage is a complex one and it needs, it needs um, attention at different levels. So, yes, we do finance the global program, UNESCO, uh, UNFPA and UNICEF. We also have our people uh, at the UN and uh, to participate in discussions, etc. Uh, we finance NGOs, um, mostly through other organizations. There's, uh, we finance, for example, three uh, um, alliances of Dutch NGOs, and I see yesterday I saw some of them. I'm not, I don't see them now, but uh, and they work, yes, and they work with a lot of local NGOs in the countries where you are from. So probably uh, you have colleagues here that are uh, uh, using those uh, financing opportunities. Uh, we also support uh, Girls Not Brides because that's also very necessary. To, so we try to, to uh, finance at different levels and not only for uh, uh, projects uh, but also for the, the, our government to have a, a clear view of what's happening in the different fields. Um, and that also helps us to lobby and advocate uh, at the different levels, using the, ex the experiences that everybody can bring to the table. Um, we also try to be a broker, to try and connect uh, 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 the different organizations from different levels, to convince other people, to persuade. Um, for example, uh, if we are in a country, uh, uh, for example, I'm working in Benin, and if the uh, local organizations, NGO, CSO, working on child marriage, come across issues that have to do with policy making at the level of the, the government of Benin. It's often very difficult for the local uh, uh, community orga organization to pick up the phone and call the minister. But if you pick up the phone and call me, I, will, I can ask our ambassador to pick up his phone and talk to the minister. So that helps. Next slide, please. Um, what do you need to know about working with the Netherlands? Well, we are a ministry. <laughs> <laughs> that means we work with public funds. And public funds are used to implement government policy. That means that we have to, well, like uh, um, Kathleen also said, we have to be able to justify the use of every single euro because it's public funding. That means that there is a quite large bureaucracy involved in order to make sure that, there's, that everything is going as it should be going because otherwise, you know, the, the, the government policy may not be uh, uh, well implemented. So there is a bureaucracy and there are rather harsh due diligence requirements. And another thing, um, our government, I mean, every, we, we have uh, elections every four years, sometimes um, uh, uh, more than every four years. So that also 
implies that government policy changes. So we have to then sort of, you know, uh, adapt and, and try and, and sometimes uh, uh, certain initiatives just stop because it's not within that the policy of that particular government. You should know that. We have a large network. Um, well, uh, as I indicated earlier, use the network. Don't be just go and 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 connect with people at uh, embassies in our countries. And you know, uh, uh, people at the embassies are really very happy to to support you and to find the best way to support you. Then um, we are Dutch, and I have one minute left, and so. Well, we tend to be direct and to the point. <laughs> uh, we, un we try to unpack issues, even if they are uh, controversial, taboo issues, because if those are problems, and if you want to help uh, 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 solve problems, you cannot solve a problem if you do not unpack it, if you do not talk about the, the, the difficult things. So, yeah, we put it on the table and we try, and knowing that we are trying to help solve it, so that's, yeah, it's sometimes it sounds a little bit uh, blunt, but if you don't do it, there's no solution. Then the next slide. Well, I can be short. Eh? One minute, 50. Eh? But anyhow, the political, t you, it may not seem so, but the political tide is with us. We saw that yesterday at various occasions. We have more data, there are more studies, there's more evidence, and if you have good evidence, it's uh, easy, well, relatively easy to persuade other people to, uh, to join you in, in the struggle. And even though we know that uh, there is a, in some countries a shrinking political space for uh, uh, NGOs, uh, I think that the voices, especially the voices of youth organizations, are getting louder. And not because the group of youth that is being uh, involved and is working together with, with, with other organizations on helping ending child marriage, the group is getting bigger, but the noise is also getting bigger. And I think there's another last slide. That's just a picture. I just wanted to show you that this is a picture of two beautiful girls. The problem only is that the older girl is a married woman and the younger one is her child. I took this picture in Lebanon a few years ago and this is a Syrian refugee. I think she was about 14 when she got married. So this fight against ending child marriage is the fight to help end uh, situations like this. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I have been selected to represent uh, the private funder perspective, which I think in this group means I'm a little bit like the crazy cousin that shows up at the family party wearing some wild outfit or something. Um, I cannot hope to do justice to the breadth and depth of what the private funders in this room represent. I'm gonna tell a little bit about our story at Candida, but know that every other individual private funder in the room really has their own unique story to tell. Um, so the Candida Fund, that's perfect there, um, is a family foundation. Um, it was founded by my mother about 15 years ago. And I tell that um, really to share that this work for us is very personal. Um, my mother feels like her own life choices were fairly circumscribed, not um, by early in child marriage, but by virtue of growing up in a relatively traditional Catholic family in the 1940s and 1950s in the United States. Um, and her experiences there I think really inform our core belief, which is not that early in child marriage is um, a bizarre cultural practice that happens somewhere else, but really a manifestation of the same system that circumscribed her own life choices, and that is the system of patriarchy or gender inequality. Um, and that really informs a lot of what we do. Uh, so let's see, next slide. So three ways in which we work to end child marriage. Um, because my last name is not Gates, um, I have to be really honest that the majority of our influence is really coming through our funding directly. And within that, I want to just highlight that 
Um, we really strive for the majority of our funding to go to community-based groups. Um, and the reason why is that, um, like many of you in the room, I, we believe that the people most affected by a problem should be the defining voice in naming that problem and in designing and shaping solutions toward that problem. Now for us, um, getting money to community-based groups as a small staff um, located in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with limited international reach, we're challenged to do that um, operationally and also uh, legally. And so we work primarily through intermediaries, um, which really help us to find terrific activist groups on the grounds in primarily India, um, Bangladesh, and Nepal, which are the three countries we we'll work most closely in. The rest of our funding um, is really split between advocacy and communications and learning, and I can uh, speak more to that on the next slide. Um, so, okay, three things you should know about working with us. Um, probably the first thing is how we define impact. Um, every funder has their own theory of the problem um, and theory of change for us. Um, and I think it's critical that you sort of know who you're sitting across from and whether that person is coming uh, to the table seeking, um, uh, seeking a partnership on the basis of a child protection strategy, um, an economic development strategy, a women's health strategy, or like us, um, the frame around adolescent girls and rights. Um, for us, impact in the short run or immediate is really around making a meaningful difference in the lives of hopefully thousands of girls today, um, not just on age of marriage, but as so many people have alluded to already so eloquently, on a much broader range of indicators, um, the agency girls have, the aspirations that they have for their future, the availability of services to them and their, uh, and their ability to access those services. So we're, we're really interested in pushing the frame of the discussion beyond um, early in child marriage. In the medium to long term, I would say very humbly, we really hope to be a meaningful contributor um, to the field, both in how the problem of early in child marriage is defined, certainly how resources flow, um, ideally to community-based organizations, and, and then thirdly, um, in what kinds of solutions are lifted up. Um, a lot of my colleagues have talked about monitoring evaluation. This is probably one of the bigger differentiators, I would say, like sarcastically, if people say, what is your monitoring and evaluation? I would say, we don't have any. Um, but, but probably more, um, respectfully and realistically. I think this is the privilege of working for a single live private donor without a board of directors is um, our donor can operate relatively intuitively. And um, she did not have the privilege of going to college for many years. She only got to go to college much later in her life. And I think as a result, she is deeply passionate about learning and what that means. And so for us, we seek grantee partners who themselves are obsessed with their own learning and continuous improvement and are really willing to, we fund their monitoring and evaluation or their learning journey and consider ourselves um, as partners in that work. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense for our organization um, not having public dollars to, um, from a top-down perspective, impose a, a strong m and &E framework. Um, Third, what we believe works, um, probably three quick points, um, holistic programming. So while girls are very much at the center of the programming that we support, um, we're really looking at um, a variety of, of efforts that engage parents and community using a social norms approach so that the onus for change is not solely on the shoulders of girls. Um, second, we're really excited, um, maybe in somewhat in contrary to what I just said, about the power and promise of girls' collectives and girls operating in solidarity. And we've seen evidence that funding those collectives, not for one year, not for three years, but 10 years more, um, can move from um, a place of individual power to group power, community level power, and then ideally what we're looking to see is longer term political power um, that those collectives can exercise. Um, and then thirdly, and this has got, I mean, I'm so thrilled by, are you leaning forward? She's leaning forward. Oh, um, okay. Um, very excited by it though, so please. Very quickly, uh, the, the um, increased um, conversation around, uh, around comprehensive sexuality education, and by that, I think we're really passionate about funding not just work that is 
about um, naming the body parts and, and sexual health, but really sexual rights, um, pleasure for boys, pleasure for girls, um, consent, um, and that takes, again, longer-term funding. Um, last slide, very quickly, maybe I'll just say, because um, I think a lot of this has been touched on, we're really excited about the, the UNICEF data and, and what's coming forth. I think we, are, we would love to see, collectively, this group ask the questions on, you know, are, are the positive indicators around age at marriage married with... <laughs> poor pun, um, with positive indicators also on girls, more girls having access to education, more girls having positive mental health outcomes, um, and, and so on and so forth. And I think with that. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. It's a real pleasure to be here. So in the UK, we situate our work on child marriage within our broader work on gender equality. And this has been a huge priority for the UK for a long time, but particularly since 2011, when we published our first strategic vision for girls and women. And in March this year, I'm really excited to say that we published our second strategic vision, this time on gender equality. And this continues many of the, our focus on many of the crucial areas that are included in the first strategic vision on girls' education, on preventing and responding to violence against women and girls, on SRHR, on women's economic empowerment. Crucially, the new vision really steps up on women's voice and political participation, and also on working in fragile and conflict contexts, which we feel was quite missing from our previous work. So on child marriage specifically, what are we doing? Um, we do we do as much as we can in terms of the UN influencing work and the wider policy influencing work. For me, a huge highlight is in 2014 when we co-hosted with UNICEF and with great partnership with Girls Not Brides, um, the first ever Girls Summit. This was a really important moment to shine a global spotlight on child marriage, also on the FGMC. And it, it helps secure a massive range of policy commitments and financial commitments from governments, from civil society and from businesses. And the most exciting thing is that this is part of a growing movement. There's been a number of girls summits which have been created and hosted by different countries and regions since then. Nepal, where several of us have just been with the, um, with the global programme, is, is hosting its second girls summit this year. It's just amazing, a real breakthrough moment for these girls and the generations that follow them. So on programming, um, our biggest targeted programme is our support to the global programme which UNICEF and UNFPA are running, which you're hearing a lot about during this programme. But child marriage is also really integral to much of our broader programming on adolescent empowerment and on girls' rights. And adolescence is such a crucial stage and the challenges are so interlinked. And our new strategic vision, which I just mentioned, really recognises this and it commits us to working across girls' and women's life cycles and on multiple areas simultaneously and with particular attention to adolescence. I really flag this as ambition. We are really committed to it. It's very hard to do, which I'll come to later. Um, but for example, we have a huge portfolio of work on girls' education, which is absolutely fundamental. Since 2015 alone, we've supported over three million girls go to school, many million before that and teenage pregnancy. Um, since 2012, we've helped about 9 million women and girls access modern methods of family planning. Violence against girl, women and girls is a huge problem. Again, this is a huge focus. We have over 130 million um, programmes working on this in different countries and a huge um, research and evidence package around what works for preventing violence. Women's voice, participation and leadership is crucial. And we're doing work to support this, the space for this, the closing civic space for this politically. Also investing in women's rights organisations and youth-led organisations and investing in leaders and in movements. We mainly do this through intermediary organisations as, as our partners have just been um, talking about as well. These are so crucial in terms of challenging harmful social norms and gender discrimination. I've been asked to talk about three things that Girls Not Brides members should know about working with DFID. First, very broadly, our focus areas are in Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, 
and also South Asia. We have 27 country offices in these regions. Um, then two very practical things. I often hear from civil society organisations that it's kind of hard to engage with different country offices. And firstly, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we really do care about these issues. But we have many, we are a donor agency, we work through other partners, we have millions of different implementing partners. And the reality is that we don't have that many staff, we, we are really stretched. So my advice to you would be that you'll be much more effective in getting engagement in our country offices if you engage through networks or with groups of organisations where possible, rather than going as individual organisations. Practical tip. And my third point, as um, has already been raised, we are funded by UK taxpayers. At the UK at the moment, we feel I feel like we're under particular scrutiny. There's even a media campaign to try to reduce some of our international budget. This means we're constantly in the papers. We are constantly being reviewed by Parliament. So our due diligence processes, as have been mentioned, our need to demonstrate impact and results are massive. This can be a massive pain for our partners, um, but we, it's unavoidable. Um, so going forward, three challenges that I'd like to identify. Um, this has been a theme throughout... One minute. <laughs> I'm on my last page. <laughs> this has been a theme throughout the conference, but a big challenge is about joining up partnerships, joining up interventions, making sure you link those education, those SRHR, those other programming. This can be difficult when you have different agencies, different people designing the programs. This is our challenge. Secondly, on strengthening the data and evidence. For example, in fragile and conflict contexts, where we know that child marriage often escalates as a desperate response to extreme circumstances, we need to know more about this, need to know more about what to do. And where there has been significant improvements, like in India and Ethiopia, really unpicking why and how this has happened and how we can share these lessons um, to other programming. And thirdly, supporting girls who are already married. How do we help them get back into school? How do we help them access family planning and give them increase their voice in the decisions that affect their lives? So I would just like to finish. There's no single step that can help stop child marriage it's about getting the legislation right, about a whole range of interventions and services. And it's about working with families and local communities. So child marriage is seen as holding girls back from their lives and it's not seen as an introduction to it. Thank you. See, I already got the mic back. <laughs> Um, so I've been wearing my Candida hat, um, but I have also had the privilege of being involved with an informer, uh, informal donor uh, collaborative working on child marriage for probably the past four or five years. Um, so I would love to make an announcement today, really as a member and representative of that collaborative. Um, as the members in this room have really noted rightfully for years, the need for much more funding to support community-based organizations um, and community-based interventions and approaches. Um, there are lots of really good intermediaries out there, but we all clearly need to recognize the imperative to do much more to better champion and resource community-led efforts. Um, so to that end, a community of donors in partnership uh, with Girls Not Brides is attempting to meaningfully contribute to filling this gap by uh, launching the Girls First Fund. So the fund is in the early stages of development and um, like five underlines under this is very much a work in progress, uh, but we really wanted to ensure that we didn't leave the global meeting without sharing this good news uh, and giving you a way to learn more about the fund. Uh, so four things to note. Number one, as I already said, really early stages of development. At this point, we're really prioritizing attracting more founding donors to the table. Um, and setting up operations through Capital for Good, where the fund is housed and working with Geneva Global, who is providing consultative services to us. Um, in 2019, we will begin a learning year in a small number of countries. 
um, really to test our own grant making criteria, our structures, our processes, and uh, shape a learning agenda in partnership with um, first uh, stage grantees. And this will really help set us up for success for longer multi-year uh, strategy going forward. Um, the fund, as I've already mentioned, is really going to be focused on uh, identifying community-based organizations uh, and locally focused national organizations um, to, um, are, that are focused on early and child marriage as well as the broader range of issues facing girls, particularly with an interest in women and girl-led organizations or women and girl-centered organizations. Um, we know we are not going to be all things to all groups. This is really meant to complement rather than supplant existing efforts out there. Um, and fourth, and probably most importantly, um, we encourage anybody who would like to learn more and would like to get involved um, to not rush up to me at the end <laughs> of the meeting, um, but really to sign up on the fund's homepage. If you go to www.girls firstfund.org. There is space for you to enter in your name and organization. There you go. Um, and you will get updates as soon as they become available in terms of grant making, etc. So we're really excited and thank you for um, all you all have done to, to push us to get to this place. Thank you. And you know all about that fund, so please do not um, <laughs> bury Dina in questions and do sign up if you want more information as it becomes available. Um, what we'd like to do now is turn to two other colleagues who've been um, gracious enough to join us um, here because we really wanted to give you the maximum chance to meet as many of the donor partners in the room and ask um, Adriana and Maxence to give a few comments and then we will open to questions. So get out your phone. If I'm being a bit of a harsh timekeeper, it's because I keep checking and there's a lot of great questions coming up. So um, I may hang on to this. Are those mics working? Okay. Donc je vais parler en français. Donc moi je travaille au ministère de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères. Euh, sur les questions de droit et santé sexuelle et reproductif. Euh, je travaille au, sous de la, au, au sein de la sous-direction du développement humain qui euh, traite des questions de mariage d'enfance sous deux angles en particulier, qui sont euh, la santé et l'éducation, euh, qui sont donc des domaines essentiels à l'autonomisation des filles. Euh, donc en 2008, on avait participé au G8 à Muskoka au Canada. Et c'est là qu'il y a eu un grand programme qui avait été lancé en faveur de la santé maternelle et infantile. Et nous avons créé donc un fonds français à Muskoka, et dans le cadre duquel nous soutenons quatre agences des Nations Unies, UNFPA, l'UNICEF, l'OMS et ONU Femmes. À la base, on avait commencé à travailler sur les questions de santé maternelle et infantile, mais très vite, on s'est aperçu que les, que, qu en fait, les personnes en situation de vulnérabilité étaient principalement les adolescents et les jeunes, notamment au vu des indicateurs de santé. Donc, comme vous le savez tous, c'est évidemment un âge dans, durant lequel les facteurs de vulnérabilité sont concentrés. Il y a à la fois donc, toutes les questions de violence à l'école, la déscolarisation, et puis euh, les, les, les grossesses et mariages. Euh, C'est pour cela qu'on a demandé euh, donc assez vite aux quatre agences bénéficiaires des fonds Muscoca euh, de vraiment prioriser leurs interventions en faveur de la santé sexuelle et reproductive des adolescents et des jeunes. Euh, donc sur le terrain, cela s'est traduit dans huit pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et du centre où intervient le fonds, par la mise en place de programmes d'éducation complète à la sexualité, à la fois en milieu scolaire et extrascolaire, euh, qui permettent l'accès à des informations euh, fiables et la transmission de savoirs sur les connaissances, les attitudes et les valeurs qui leur permettent de faire des choix éclairés sur leur vie et leurs relations interpersonnelles. Il y a d'autres interventions dans le cadre du fonds Muscoca, et j'en citerai que quelques-unes, mais il y a également donc, la mise en place d'espaces conviviaux pour les jeunes dans les centres de santé, ou encore la mise en place de lignes vertes anonymes et confidentielles pour justement rendre ces services plus accessibles et adaptés à leurs besoins. 
Euh, donc les droits humains et l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes sont vraiment au cœur de ce processus d'apprentissage euh, qui vise donc notamment à réduire euh, le nombre de grossesses non désirées et contribue à, la, à, à éviter la déscolarisation des filles. Et ça m'amène au deuxième secteur dans lequel la France euh, centre son action extérieure, qui est celle de l'éducation. Euh, donc nous avons lancé une stratégie en 2017 pour euh, l'éducation, la formation professionnelle et l'insertion. Euh, et euh, nous, nous tentons à travers de notre action d'étendre l'accès à l'éducation primaire et jusqu'à l'éducation secondaire et promouvoir l'éducation des filles. Donc la France a annoncé cette année en février euh, au Sénégal euh, lors euh, de la conférence de reconstitution des fonds du partenariat mondial pour l'éducation euh, un engagement euh, de 200 millions d'euros euh, pour le prochain triennum pour euh, justement concrétiser cet engagement. Mais nous sommes également engagés euh, auprès de l'UNESCO qui soutient les cadres éducatifs pour renforcer les politiques publiques. Euh, donc nous mettons en œuvre des formations qui sont euh, basées sur les expériences et les bonnes pratiques qui permettent vraiment d'échanger concrètement et éclairer les décideurs pour prévenir les violences à l'école. Euh, donc, euh, un secteur que nous, que, que nous ciblons en particulier, ce sont donc les facteurs de blocage socio-économique qui empêchent les filles d'accéder à l'éducation euh, et d'achever le cycle éducatif de base et puis continuer les études euh, dans un cycle d'enseignement supérieur. Donc il s'agit évidemment de la question des mariages d'enfants, mais aussi de pauvreté, les coûts de scolarisation élevés, la faible formation des enseignants, les stéréotypes sur le rôle des femmes, et plus, et plus largement les violences de genre en milieu scolaire. Euh, donc euh, une, chose une, une leçon qu'on peut en tirer, c'est que, et, évidemment, une, sans une réflexion en profondeur sur ces facteurs de blocage, l'impact de nos projets sera limité. Et notre agence française de développement développe euh, des nouveaux projets euh, transversaux qui visent justement à agir sur euh, à la fois euh, le nexus santé et éducation des filles. Euh, L'AFD a, a lancé euh, très récemment donc, un nouveau programme au Niger justement qui cible à la fois l'accès aux services de santé sexuelle et reproductive, la réduction des vulnérabilités et le maintien des filles à l'école par l'extension des filets, euh, par les dispositifs de filets sociaux. Voilà, en quelques mots. Merci. Bonjour à tous. D'habitude, je me trouve toujours un peu isolé quand je participe à ce type d'événement, étant le seul homme présent dans ce panel. Mais je suis assez content de voir que dans la salle, on a de plus en plus d'hommes qui sont ici. J'en vois certains, si vous voulez lever la main. Des champions féministes. Et j'espère qu'on arrivera à une égalité, peut-être, dans les, dans les prochaines, prochaines conférences qui montre l'importance qu'on qu accorde aussi à l'engagement avec les, les garçons et avec les hommes euh, pour mettre un terme au mariage précoce et forcé. Euh, à l'Union européenne, nous avons euh, une opportunité absolument incroyable, puisque nous avons un, un commissaire européen pour le, la coopération internationale et le développement, qui chaque fois qu'il fait un discours, commence toujours par dire qu'il est un homme féministe, et qui porte ce dossier depuis déjà quelques années, malheureusement il s'en ira l'année prochaine, mais il a vraiment porté au cœur de notre action internationale la priorité sur l'égalité homme-femme et sur l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles. Nous avons un plan d'action égalité homme-femme. C'est déjà le deuxième plan d'action qui a été adopté l'année dernière et qui nous oblige chaque année à rapporter sur un certain nombre d'indicateurs sur ce que nous faisons pour améliorer la situation des femmes et des filles dans le monde et y compris à l'intérieur de l'Union européenne, ce que nous faisons en termes d'égalité hommes-femmes, euh, également sur le nombre, le nombre de postes qui sont accordés aux femmes, sur les, les, les résultats qui sont, qui, sont, qui sont atteints, sur l'intégration de cette dimension dans tous les projets et dans tous les programmes que l'Union européenne fait. Nous sommes obligés d'intégrer cette dimension euh, de manière transversale. Donc il y a vraiment une, une priorité et des instruments euh, pour ça. Il n'y a pas très longtemps aussi... Nous avons organisé à Bruxelles, euh, il y a trois semaines, les Journées européennes pour le développement. Peut-être que vous avez vu ça euh, dans les médias. Et pour la première fois, ces Journées européennes ont porté uniquement sur la question euh, d'égalité hommes-femmes et d'autonomisation des femmes et des filles. Euh, je crois que c'était un succès euh, sans précédent avec euh, quelques milliers de participants. Tout un nombre d'ONG qui étaient présentes, et notamment Girls Not Rights, euh, qui a participé à un panel de haut niveau euh, qui a été organisé à, à ce moment-là. Et donc nous a, je crois que nous avons été assez satisfaits de l'engagement et de la qualité des discussions pendant ces, ces trois jours. 
En ce qui concerne le soutien de l'Union européenne, euh, donc nous soutenons les projets conjoints des Nations unies, UNICEF, UNFPA, sur les mariages précoces et forcés et sur les mutilations génitales féminines. Et nous avons aussi tout un nombre de projets bilatéraux où nous soutenons des ONG dans des pays, euh, divers pays, une, une quinzaine de projets euh, mis en œuvre uniquement par des organisations euh, de la société civile. Et puis bien évidemment, euh, vous le savez tous, euh, nous avons lancé euh, l'année dernière notre nouvelle initiative Spotlight euh, pour mettre un terme aux violences contre les femmes et les enfants, qui est vraiment notre cadre d'intervention euh, pour les cinq prochaines années. C'est un processus bien évidemment complexe, en construction, et qui, a, qui est un engagement direct entre l'Union européenne et, euh, et le secrétariat général euh, des Nations unies. Et bien évidemment, les organisations de la, de la société civile seront parmi les principales bénéficiaires euh, de la mise en œuvre de cette initiative Spotlight. Donc cette initiative, assez rapidement, elle est divisée en continents, elle est divisée en thématiques. Euh, en Afrique, euh, la thématique qui a été retenue euh, concerne les violences basées sur le genre et concerne les pratiques néfastes que sont les, les, les mutilations génitales féminines et les mariages précoces et forcés. Après, la décision de mise en œuvre sera prise au niveau des pays, au sein d'une concertation entre agence, euh, les agences pays des Nations Unies, nos délégations de l'Union Européenne dans les pays et la société civile qui participera à l'identification euh, des priorités et des programmes à soutenir. Euh, il y aura aussi une partie des financements qui sera fléchée spécifiquement pour les, pour les organisations de la société civile, avec un pourcentage à définir qui sera un minimum de 10%, euh, et à travers des mécanismes qui restent aussi à définir. Euh, je crois qu'on est assez aligné entre, entre bailleurs dans nos interventions, euh, puisque nous parlons tous de, 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 de l'importance de mettre en place des réseaux. Nous savons que nous avons des mécanismes de financement qui sont complexes, qui sont parfois durs à comprendre, mais euh, nous avons une exigence de redevabilité et nous ne pouvons pas changer ces règles. Euh, C'est pour ça que nous vous encourageons à, à créer des alliances et des réseaux d'ONG pour être plus à même d'arriver à, à capter nos fonds. Après, nous avons des, évidemment des, des mécanismes de financement qui sont assez différents. Euh, nous pouvons soutenir des projets de petite envergure, on va dire, et des projets évidemment d'ambition un, 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 un peu plus élaborés avec des projets régionaux. Et donc nous essayons d'adapter la taille de nos, de nos, de nos, de nos financements euh, aux capacités évidemment de, de nos partenaires. Mais nous vous encourageons évidemment à frapper à la porte de nos délégations de l'Union européenne à l'étranger. Venez nous voir, venez discuter avec nous parce que la, la, la prise de décision se fait très souvent au niveau local. Nous, ici au siège, comme le disait notre, notre, notre collègue du Canada, on décide des stratégies et des politiques. Mais après, la mise en œuvre se fait nécessairement dans les pays. Donc venez nous voir, n'ayez pas peur. Et, euh... Un des défis, je voulais terminer avec ça, un des défis pour nous, et évidemment, de, 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 notre collègue de Diffie l'a également mentionné, je crois de, 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 de connecter aussi nos programmes. Et c'est là où nous ne sommes pas assez, assez, assez performants pour l'instant, notamment sur cette thématique, c'est d'arriver à relier ce que nous faisons en termes d'éducation pour les jeunes filles, en termes de santé, en termes de droits sexuels et reproductifs, mais aussi en termes de, de protection, protection des enfants, protection sociale. Nous avons tout un nombre de projets assez importants et... Un, je crois qu'une des recommandations de notre côté pour nous, c'est d'essayer de, de, de travailler davantage pour, pour arriver à, à connecter nos, nos actions. Merci bien. Thank you very much. Um, please, thank you to the panel for and for being uh, bearing with my timekeeping. So now this is your time. Um, we have uh, two advanced questions. We actually have a lot, but. Um, there were some pre-meetings, both of the national partnerships and also the youth organizations. So apologies to the panel, but I'm going to skip over the prepared questions and go right to some of the ones that we've received already. I've been peeking at my phone. There's quite a few coming in. I am going to ask Heather's help because as I read them, I can't decide where to start. So I will let her help us uh, screen those. Um, but let me start... Um, The national partnership groups, one of the questions they asked, I alluded to before, or said before, which is kind of, what is our vision for sustainability? That donors, like many in the room, have a long-term vision, and yet we often fund on very short-term cycles. Um, so talk to us about that. How do you manage that tension? How should we think about that? And I'll ask them, two of you to jump in on that. 
Are you pointing to each other or? <laughs> no. Who would like to Who would like to take that? Okay, Maxalls, do you want to start? And who is the other? Mika. Okay, perfect. Euh, comment est-ce qu'on on peut, on peut inscrire nos actions euh, de manière durable euh, je, je crois qu'on essaye d'avoir une certaine flexibilité dans la manière dont nous, nous utilisons nos instruments de financement et notamment, euh, je pense plus particulièrement à l'instrument européen pour la démocratie et les droits de l'homme euh, qui est un instrument uniquement dédié euh, au soutien de la, de la société civile et cet instrument est l'instrument le plus flexible que nous ayons euh, à notre disposition puisqu'il peut intervenir de manière confidentielle dans des pays sans forcément en avoir l'accord, et il peut financer des projets sur une durée de maximale de 4 à 5 ans. Et je crois que quand on parle de ce, de, de, de ce, type, ce type de durée, euh, on est vraiment inscrit euh, dans, dans la durabilité, et euh, on a mis en place ces mesures euh, dans un souci euh, de, 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 de soutenir nos partenaires euh, de la société civile, euh, qui effectivement ont des difficultés euh, euh, parfois à mettre en place euh, des projets sur une durée plus courte. Euh, on sait qu'il euh, y a une période de préparation très souvent dans les projets, dans la mise en œuvre. Euh, on a souvent besoin de six mois, un an pour mettre en place des, euh, les, 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 les lignes de référence, pour mettre en place les cadres logiques, pour les adapter. Et je crois que sur ça, je voulais dire d'ailleurs que le, pour nous, on voit les cadres logiques euh, comme quelque chose de flexible, d'évolutif. Euh, Ce n'est pas quelque chose de fixé euh, nécessairement dans la pierre euh, à la signature du programme, mais quelque chose qui doit s'améliorer au fur et à mesure. Et donc je crois qu'il vaut mieux construire des ambitions au fur et à mesure plutôt que d'être trop ambitieux euh, de manière générale dès, la, dès le début. Et euh, sur la durabilité, je voulais aussi faire le lien avec euh, la, le, 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 les accès restreints euh, que nous voyons de plus en plus euh, d'intervention des ONG. Et donc euh, ce que nous essayons de faire aussi pour, pour continuer à financer euh, à long terme dans ce type de, 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 de contexte est d'avoir une flexibilité sur le, sur le type de partenariat que nous pouvons faire et donc de financer à la fois des organisations qui sont parfois enregistrées, d'autres qui ne sont pas enregistrées, euh, des personnes individuelles. Euh, nous passons parfois aussi par des sociétés de type commercial quand des transferts de fonds par des, par des ONG ne sont pas possibles dans, dans, dans certains pays. Et donc pour toujours essayer de pouvoir continuer à avoir une inscription à, une programmation à long terme, dans le, dans, 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 quel que soit le type de contexte d'intervention. Yeah, um, long-term vision and short-term <coughs> finances. Uh, yeah, if we uh, speak about the Netherlands uh, government, uh, there is a long-term vision, yes, when we talk about human rights, gender uh, and, and women rights, and sexual reproductive health and, and rights. I think that the, the vision that has been developed uh, in those areas will not sort of uh, uh, go away when there is a new government. Uh, those are, that's long-term vision. But as I explained uh, earlier on, um, our funds are uh, meant to implement government policy. And with uh, every new government, there may be new policies. So, Uh, and that's one of the reasons, the most important reason, I think, why uh, f uh, if we talk about bilateral uh, projects, so projects between the Netherlands government and your organizations, uh, I think maximum is four or five years because that is sort of the maximum uh, period that the government uh, will sit. What we try to do is to be as, 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 uh, 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 as good a partner as possible so that We, if, for example, we uh, enter into a contract with, with you today and we have a, a new government tomorrow, that we will stick to what we have uh, agreed upon on the day before the, the government came. But that's about it, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, we also had a question from um, some of the youth organizations. Um, one of their questions was, <laughs> How do you support effective community-based youth-centered initiatives, such as those with girls and boys, those that promote youth leadership to end violence against women and girls, and then encourage young women and men to be flag bearers of change in the fight against child marriage? I would say they were polite in their question. Um, I will reframe it a little bit, which is we hear a lot about the importance of young people's leadership, about youth-centered and youth-led groups, and yet 
Um, in donor conversations, we often say that's very hard to fund, very hard to reach. So what are your ideas for getting resources to groups that are really genuinely youth-led um, and supporting young people in their communities to make change? Please. Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc je vais répondre à cette question en citant un exemple qui est celui de la Côte d'Ivoire où euh, notre ambassade soutient très activement euh, ce qu'on appelle un think tank euh, de la santé euh, des, des champions euh, de santé reproductive en lien avec euh, une ONG française, euh, Médecins du Monde. Et euh, là, euh, c'est clairement euh, un exemple de collaboration à, à, entre des groupes de jeunes et des ONG qui sont euh, voilà, plutôt bien établies pour justement essayer euh, d'accéder à des financements euh, de l'ambassade. Et euh, c'est quelque chose euh, donc, qui a déjà été recommandé par mes collègues, mais que je recommande vivement, c'est de voir comment est-ce que vous pouvez euh, grossir un petit peu vos, vos rangs, justement, euh, en, vous, euh, en vous alliant à d'autres ONG euh, qui, qui sont peut-être plus anciennes ou euh, qui ne sont pas aussi jeunes que vous, et euh, voir comment ensemble est-ce que vous pouvez euh, voilà, vous, vous rapprocher un petit peu euh, des bailleurs. Um, I think this is very much at the heart of what we try to do at the Candida Fund. Um, the, a lot of the intermediaries that we work with share the same value and, and um, our funding and looking specifically for youth-led groups um, and our supporting building their capacity. We have some dedicated um, grants for exactly this purpose. Um, and in addition, we do some, um, we have a separate initiative that is supporting um, youth mentorship around South Asia that is pairing young feminist activists um, in South Asia with, um, with uh, more seasoned activists, although it seems like it's turning out the mentorship is actually in, in both directions, which is as it should be. Um, the, the other comment I guess I would make is one of the best things that I think um, the young people are bringing to the table is um, a, a much more, um, a less siloed approach. And, and we do a fair bit of work on climate change domestically and a little bit internationally. And um, I'm really heartened by the ways in which um, some of the young feminist groups are really looking at um, the intersections between climate, girls' rights, Um, what happens when uh, a community is destabilized um, by, by climate change? Um, and is that not only um, just a repressive situation for young girls in that community, but is it actually an opportunity um, to reform not only um, uh, a more climate resilient economy, but at the same time create new opportunities for girls and women. So we're actually funding a particular stream of work in, in that domain as well um, across Candida. So yes, I think, yes, yes. And Joe, I didn't mind, would you, is there something you wanted to add on? Or? Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to add on a, a quick one that we work with, we all work through intermediate organizations. It's very difficult to fund this type of movement directly. So we do fund a lot of organisations that you might be familiar with who can help this. For example, Restless Development, we give a lot of funding to in the UK who do a lot of youth-based work. Um, Amplify Change, many of us are donors to Amplify Change who are also supporting networks and there are many other examples. So while you might not see our funding directly, a lot of the organisations you work with probably do receive funding from us. Thank you. So, um, Heather, I'm going to turn to you in one moment. I have one more question that I did want to pose, given um, conversations that we've had in the hallways and what we've heard, which is really this question around monitoring and evaluation impact, showing that we're making a difference. Um, I would posit that we all want to make a difference and know what of our work um, is actually leading to change and what may not be the most kind of effective way to lead change. So I don't think it's that anyone in the room is not interested in knowing if we have impact. Um, but what we heard from um, donors is that they're really under pressure to show the value of international development aid. Um, it's become very public conversation in many countries. It is a challenging part of national budgets often. Um, and what we hear from many of the groups that get supported be they community-based groups, kind of whatever size and type group, is that um, they're required to report on many different kinds of outcomes and indicators, 
Sometimes you're asked to collect data that actually isn't helpful to you in your own programming and in forms and time frames that don't necessarily match how you're thinking about change. So what, um, as donors, um, are you doing and thinking about to kind of bridge that gap or to make this a little easier so we can all learn more what, what is actually working? Who'd like that one? Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. And then, and then I'll skip to Joe and Mika and then um, to Heather for questions. Um, I think we really, we know that this is a big challenge. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, we do try and put lots of resources up on our websites about how to apply for funding and how to do your results-based management and all those things. But when we were creating the Feminist International Assistance Policy, we did do a very large consultation. And we heard loud and clear <laughs> that our processes are too cumbersome, that they are difficult to understand. And so right now, we're also looking at not just the what, which we've put out there, but how, and how can we streamline some of our processes? How can we make things easier to understand? Um, we do, especially with smaller organizations, use a, a, a type of agreement that we call a contribution agreement that does allow for time in the first six months to work directly with programs to actually build that um, results framework and um, and I hear that people feel that they're being asked to um, you know collect data or report on things that don't matter to them and I think that's really unfortunate and I know that my results based management specialist in my team is always saying you know this is a project management document it's a living document it should be useful to you and I think um, it's important when you're working with the program officer who's supporting your project to have those conversations to make sure that it is useful. And when I work with my partners, I, I try to remind them, like, this is, this is your document. And it should be that you are the ones that feel you're using it. And when it is really good for you, it actually is really good for me. I actually get more out of um, reporting when I can see that it's really contributing to the goals that you set out for yourself. And so what we need to do is help you articulate those goals uh, more effectively. But we, we have heard that loud and clear. I don't have something huge to say on this because I think it is a real challenge, especially for smaller organisations. And we're really aware of this and we are trying to strip back some of the processes in the reporting. We're always going to be under pressure to demonstrate impact, under a lot of pressure. I think there's some organisations that are that we work with that are really looking at this and doing a good job. Again, I'll use Amplify Change that many of us fund, but I think they're working quite cleverly with some of the organisations that they work with to help them develop, to identify just a couple of indicators that they can use to keep us donors happy that shows the overall impact, but then really to work with a smaller organizations to really identify what is going to be helpful for those organizations to move their, their, their mission forward. So I think this is an ongoing discussion. Another area that I'm very conscious of in the UK is that for a long time we've been very focused on numbers, 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 and we're finally remembering that this actually isn't what makes transformative change in a lot of cases. So we're really thinking through how do we do more qualitative indicators about success and things that might go longer term. But it's a um, a challenge and it's and you know, we would welcome your help and views on how to do this better. Thank you. Heather. So I've taken the liberty of combining some of the questions um, because there are quite a few that were very similar. Um, and the top questions coming in actually have to do with race and power and privilege. Um, and the one that I thought was really striking was the, the one that's gotten the most votes is look at the stage and look at the audience. How do you as funders address the dynamics of race, power, and privilege in your work with grantees and drafting RFPs? And linked to that, there are questions around how, with the lack of donors from the Global South, and can you do anything to bring in more donors from Africa and Asia and other regions? And how do we go about really prioritizing funding communities in a world where donors set financing priorities? So who'd like to jump in on the question of the race and power? <laughs> if we had an, an easy answer, it would look very different. But it would be great to bring people in on how we're thinking about and things that you do either in your grant making or strategy sessions to address that, as well as ideas on bringing in 
other types, other other national governments, other organizations. So, would you? Okay. Over here. I'm sorry. Uh, that's a really great question, and I think it's one that um, in Canada I think we're we're quite aware of. Um, we did some very deliberate things in the International Assistance Review. So uh, I think over 70 missions hosted consultations in country. Uh, we had six that specifically hosted consultations with women's rights organizations. And so this has been like a big part of this. And, and in fact, now in our, um, in our documentation, when we're saying we want to support a project, we have to write a whole memo to the minister. And we have to explain to her exactly how that project was developed in consultation with, um, with women's uh, rights organizations or girls' rights organizations. And so how are women and girls participating in the design of our projects and how will they participate in the implementation and the evaluation of those projects? So that's a big shift that we have to do. Um, we actually have legislation called the Official Development Assistance Accountability Act, the ODAAA we call it, and that also has requirements that it takes in the perspectives of the poor, that it um, doesn't, uh, it does no harm in terms of human rights. Um, and so we, we rely on, on that legislation and there's due diligence that we have to fill in to say this project is compliant. But I also think that um, our minister's decision to bring six girls, they were from Mali, Benin, uh, Jamaica, from Canada, and, uh, oh, I've lost my last one, um, but she brought these girls, oh, Lebanon was another one, so she brought these girls in, and she, they sat at the table with us, uh, with development ministers, and they had a, a voice uh, in telling them what it was like to live through their adolescence, and what is needed from us, and so part of that shift is actually saying, at the highest levels, in all these places, we need to bring uh, people who are really know what matters to the table. Well, since I'm having the mic, um, well, uh, I, well, we're we're quite similar, I think, in the way we deal with uh, with with assessment of uh, uh, with decision making on what to fund and what to support. Uh, every single proposal that is being uh, submitted to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs whether it's on sexual reproductive health and rights, whether it's on water management, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on food security, every single uh, project uh, assessment process has to give attention to uh, possible consequences on gender relations and women's rights. That's every single project. And if uh, the, the, the assessment is not positive, the project proposal will, will not go any further in the process. Uh, the same, we also have to explain uh, in every uh, assessment process what is the relationship of this particular uh, program, of the, 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 the objectives of the project that uh, you want to uh, support with the SDGs and also with the, obviously, with the policy goals of our of our ministry. And as I explained earlier on, SRHR, human rights uh, are at the basis of that uh, policy. So, well. Thank you. Does anyone, um, okay, let's go down. This is an important question, yeah, please. Shall I do a quick one? <laughs> yeah, no, it's important. I completely agree with that question. And also with the points that have happened, that have already been mentioned. We also have this in legislation, we have the, 2014 Gender Equality Act, which means that all of our development and assistance and humanitarian aid must consider gender equality impacts. But I think we have a bigger question in the agency about where do we put the power and where do we put the decision making. And this is something that we're really addressing in terms of our civil society funding at the moment. We already support a lot, a number of women's rights organisations, but we're looking about how we can really invest, strengthen more um, invest more in women's rights organisations but also importantly how we can engage better as differed with women's rights organisations so they're always at the table and also how we can work on this civic space issue so we can support women's rights organisations to negotiate and talk to the government better so I think that's um, a really important area we're also more generally looking at in at terms of our civil society funding this is one of our key policy ambitions at the moment is to 
try to shift the balance of our civil society funding so not so much of it goes to international NGOs and more of the pot gets more directly to southern based nationally owned NGOs in the countries that we're working in. Oui, je, juste pour rajouter à tout ce qui a été dit, euh, donc, euh, en France, nous avons euh, créé au ministère une plateforme genre et développement qui est, qui, qui est en fait un partenariat multi-acteur où il y a à la fois des représentants de la société civile, de la recherche, d'autres ministères, des collectivités territoriales. Et, euh, et cette plateforme donc, produit... Euh, euh, donc, se regroupe en groupe de travail et a notamment euh, contribué à l'élaboration de notre nouvelle... Euh, euh, stratégie pour euh, l'action extérieure, pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes, qui est donc une priorité du gouvernement. Euh, S'agissant des euh, projets terrain, donc euh, l'AFD, euh, évidemment, avant chaque projet, mène des consultations, donc à la fois avec euh, les partenaires euh, institutionnels, mais également avec les organisations euh, non gouvernementales euh, qu'elle soutient. Donc il y a vraiment ce travail, en fait, on a vraiment besoin de la société civile et on travaille avec elle pour faire avancer euh, la question de l'égalité femmes-hommes. Pour chaque projet, pour chaque programme, nous, nous, utilisons, nous utilisons un marqueur genre euh, qui nous permet d'évaluer effectivement la, comment la, 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 la dimension transversale des droits des femmes et l'automisation des femmes est intégrée dans, la, dans les projets. Nous avons un objectif très spécifique euh, qui est d'atteindre justement euh, plus de 70% des projets, 80% des projets dans les, dans les années qui viennent. Donc chaque année, nous mesurons euh, les résultats accomplis et, euh, et euh, sur les 3-4 dernières années, nous avons vu des, 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 des progrès assez considérables, même si après on peut ouvrir un débat sur la manière euh, dont cet outil est, est utilisé. Deuxième chose que je voulais mentionner, euh, en alignement avec les objectifs durables pour le développement, nous essayons de développer de plus en plus euh, l'approche « leave no one behind euh, »,« ne laisser personne derrière ». Et, euh, et mettre cette, cette, ce principe en pratique euh, dans nos politiques et dans nos programmes, je crois que ça va être le défi pour les, pour les années à venir, euh, assurer que nos actions euh, ne se concentrent pas sur les, sur les, les bénéficiaires les plus, les plus faciles à atteindre, mais puissent aller dans les zones les plus reculées, euh, adresser euh, les, les, multiplications, les discriminations multiples que les, que les, que les personnes, dont les personnes peuvent souffrir. Euh, un des piliers de la Spotlight euh, que j'ai mentionné tout à l'heure est spécifiquement de soutenir les ONG qui œuvrent pour les droits des femmes et l'autonomisation des femmes euh, dans les pays. Donc euh, ça va être une, une des priorités pour nous. Et, euh, et euh, pour chaque projet que nous finançons, euh, nous menons des consultations avec la société civile dans les pays. Et nous, organisations, nous organisons aussi des sessions de, 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 de formation sur nos instruments, sur nos règles, sur nos financements, pour s'assurer que vous ayez en main euh, les, 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 la connaissance des, des, des procédures euh, relatives à l'Union européenne. Donc ça, c'est un principe absolument euh, systématique. Et, euh, et enfin, un dernier, un dernier élément que je voulais mentionner, euh, dans nos appels à propositions, il y a toujours une obligation de travailler avec des ONG qui sont issues du pays de mise en œuvre. Et ça, c'est une, une nécessité absolue. Un, un, un projet qui ne, qui ne respecte pas ce, ce critère sera nécessairement éliminé. Thank you. Heather, you have another for us? Yes, we had a number of questions from participants from different regions. Mm -hmm. um, regions that they feel are not getting the kind of attention that they need. Uh, West African participants, where they say, you know, We've, we have the highest rates, why are we not receiving more funding? Um, Uh, Latin America, where rates are not falling, it's the only region where rates aren't falling, and like Southeast Asia, which is also mentioned, there are a lot of middle-income countries, so it isn't prioritized in donor assistance. And I was wondering if the panelists could talk about that together. So could I get maybe two comments on the question of geography and kind of how you decide or what opportunities there are for places that may receive less funding? Donc pour répondre à la question sur l'Afrique de l'Ouest et notamment le Sahel, c'est effectivement donc la sous-région de l'Afrique où les indicateurs de santé sont les plus, sont les plus 
sont les plus bas en fait et, euh, et effectivement si l'on compare avec d'autres euh, d'autres régions de l'Afrique il euh, y a vraiment un énorme gap donc euh, la France a participé à la création de l'alliance Sahel euh, qui est une alliance donc euh, qui vise justement à rassembler euh, plus de financements pour cette région là non seulement sur les questions euh, euh, d'éducation et d'employabilité des jeunes mais aussi sur les questions de sécurité euh, et bien d'autres et je sais que euh, il y a des gouvernements qui euh, il y a donc euh, maintenant une bonne dizaine de bailleurs euh, qui ont rejoint cette alliance et d'autres qui sont sur le point euh, euh, de la rejoindre. Donc euh, nous essayons vraiment de capter l'attention euh, sur cette région-là. Oui, Peut-être sur la, la balance géographique. Euh, effectivement, on est assez conscient de la difficulté d'avoir un, un équilibre euh, euh, dans notre soutien entre les régions et en fonction des, des indicateurs de prévalence mais ce que nous essayons de faire dans nos appels à propositions, c'est qu'on a une possibilité d'avoir une balance géographique équilibrée en fonction de la qualité des projets qui sont reçus. C'est-à-dire que si on fait un appel à propositions et qu'on reçoit une quinzaine de propositions qui seront classées en premier dans une zone spécifique, on peut décider d'aller piocher aussi dans la liste pour effectivement pouvoir couvrir d'autres régions euh, dans lesquels nous savons que les besoins sont assez, euh, sont assez importants. Et on, on utilise cette, cette possibilité de plus en plus, effectivement, pour essayer d'avoir une couverture euh, la, plus, euh, la plus élargie possible. Heather, do you have another We got several questions around overhead and core costs, uh, and particularly for an issue like this that's so multisectoral. Um, how do we overcome that tension and build the capacity of local NGOs to, keep, to respond to that? and donors aren't providing that support, do you see that changing in the future? So the balance between providing or not providing overhead? And general core support, general support, core okay, costs, so our, and, yeah. and how, so how are you thinking about that? Comment on um, the general support, um, and then where it's not general support, uh, the balance of what we allow and consider Um, groups can use for actually running their programs. Thoughts on that? Go ahead. Um, it, it is a really challenging element, and I think that um, in light of particularly those of us who are, you know, um, ministries, um, and where there is a big demand on on. Um, measuring results and things like that, it's much easier to measure the results of a program than an organization. And I, and I do think that um, it can be um, true core funding. Um, it's not something that I'm, I'm seeing necessarily coming on the table for most organizations. However, one of the new programs that we, that we or initiatives that we launched is the Women's Voice and Leadership. And I think this is a bit of a compromise to that because the Women's Voice and Leadership um, is $150 million to support uh, women's rights organizations in uh, over 30 countries. And the decision was made that we aren't going to pick themes, we aren't going to pick priorities, we're just going to fund women's rights organizations to work on the issues that they say they want to work on and how they want to work on them. So it's not true core funding. There will always be conditions that are actually not set by us or set by our treasury board around you know, how much overhead um, can go into those. But I think that, was a, that is a real genuine effort to recognize that for women's rights organizations who have been starved for many, many years, um, that one of their challenges as well was that everyone, when they did get funding, was saying, and you will work on this, or you will do this, you'll do that. So that is one initiative that we have launched that is trying to really support women's rights organizations to work on what they want to work on. And I will um, take off my moderator hat just for one moment and speak to an effort that's underway with a number of uh, the private foundations, so the, not the government, but um, folks like <laughs> Dina's foundation, um, in the US, which is a project across quite a few foundations to actually look at what is real overhead Um, because one of the things that we found, and I certainly know from when I was running projects, if you were a donor and you told me you'd do 20%, I'd give you my budget with 20%. If you told me that you didn't accept any overhead, I had to redo my budget and show you that I didn't have any overhead, which was ridiculous. Um, but what it means is organizations end up not actually knowing 
mm-hmm. what it costs to run programs. And so part of this effort is to be able to give some big bucket examples. It's really an advocacy effort facing philanthropy, but hopefully will be useful to civil society organizations where they can kind of say, well, I'm kind of like this group, so a reasonable overhead would be this. Um, And once that's available, I think they're working on it this year, it's something that I'm sure those foundations would be happy to share with GNB to get out through the membership. But I think the idea is that this is really philanthropy facing, to push philanthropy, to be more thoughtful about this, but also to help organizations better understand what it costs. So, um, uh, uh, last comment, and then we're at time. So you have one, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, we started uh, 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 an experiment in uh, working together with uh, uh, NGOs in a, in a partnership way. What we did, uh, and not only on the, on the field, in the field of SRHR, but also in other uh, fields, we uh, sent out a call for tender, uh, in which we said, okay, for example, on SRHR, we said, okay, we are inviting uh, uh, groups of NGOs uh, that will help us in uh, realizing um, better information uh, of young people on uh, issues related to sexual reproductive health and rights, and uh, organizations that want to help us in uh, uh, improving the sexual rights issues. Uh, organizations would send, and we only asked for a theory of change and a track record. And I could see uh, uh, people in the, in, the, in the room that have actually participated in that, uh, and are, are still participating. But what we en- ended up with was not a project document with a budget and so much and so much for overhead and so much for this and for that. No, we, we said, okay, we believe in your theory of change. We have seen your track record, so we can trust that you can do the job. And we agreed on results. And every year we get together and we sit together and we look at the results, etc. So that, it, that, in fact, it's a kind of uh, core funding or uh, a general uh, budget support to the organization. So, and we're still in the experiment and I'm happy with it. Thank you. So I think we're at time. Mm-hmm. Unless, yes. Yes. Um, I just have, before you close, I just have a couple quick announcements. Mm -hmm. We received far more questions than I could possibly read. So what I, what I will do is I will send the panelists the questions so at least they know what you're asking about and um, can have an idea for when you approach them of how they might want to answer that. Uh, And to, there were a lot of good suggestions as well that they could incorporate. Secondly, um, with your headsets, please return them at the end of the day. Again, they will die. The batteries will die if you don't return them to be recharged. So do return them at the end of the day. And then finally, there are a number of spaces in the village for you to write on walls about your programming. That will be used. We'll be using that in social media. Um, And please sign up for open space conversations by 12.30 today. If you don't have your... Uh, your proposal up by 12.30 today, you won't be able to communicate out to everyone else. So thank you for indulging the uh, logistical announcements. Thank you. And um, the panel's not going anywhere. We're here for the next, I mean, we are leaving the stage, but um, they're all looking. Um, We are around and really appreciate the questions. I've been looking through, and I think these are the ones we need. And I just want to thank all of you very much. Thank you very much.